Okay, let's go. <laughs> Great. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here and welcome to uh, this, um, well, session one of the electrification series here put on by the Studio for High Performance Design and Construction. It's, it's great to see so many folks virtually here joining us. Uh, my name is Aaron Gunnarsson. Hello, for those who can see me on, on your screen. Um, I'm, I help with the Studio for High Performance Design and Construction. I also uh, work with Pass Files, Massachusetts, so some of you may see, see me at, at those various events, but it's, it's great to be here and have you folks here. Um, Let's see. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, like I said, this is uh, put on by the Studio for High Performance Design and Construction. Uh, a lot of your names I recognize. You, you've been to some of the events we put on before, but I do see a few new names here as well. So maybe some folks new to new to the studio. Um, the studio is a physical classroom space in, in Newton. Um, it's in a high performance uh, uh, building, actually a passive house certified certified building there, shares an office with Armandale Builders who do a lot of work on, on high performance and passive house homes. But it was set up to be a classroom for teaching folks, every everybody from, from folks, members of the community, architects, builders, people how to build better better homes, whether that's taking care of their own home or folks who are you know within the industry working on projects that they, they work on. Um, for the last you know two years or so, we've uh, we've kind of taken a break from in-person sessions there at the studio, and we've transitioned to doing some occasional ones here remotely, like like this one today. Um, and in fact, today is the start of a brand new series that we're launching um, online. So actually, we got some photos here. This is the outside of the studio. Uh, for those who have not been there, um, this is just the front front door there, the south side facing. Uh, door at the top is a bunch of solar panels. The the building is uh, it's close to you know near net zero. Um, I believe it some years it has been net zero. Actually, we've we've done a few calculations here, um, but kind of a cool place. And this is the inside. Some sessions we put on. This is one from when we had a, had C Basic present uh, on some stuff there. But that's usually what it looks like on the inside. Today. We're here in the virtual space with me, Erin Gunnarsson, there on the right. And joining me on the left is Kate Stevenson. I'll let her say hello and introduce herself as well. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, thanks, Erin. Uh, I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm up in Montpelier, Vermont, and I'm a co-owner of Helm Construction Solutions and on the board of the Studio for High Performance Design and Construction. So. Um, I work in the in the green building industry in general with with contractors and architects from all around the country. Um, and you'll get to hear a little bit more in the presentation about some of the projects I've been working on in my own house. All right, great. Um, oh. So here we go. And this is, like I said, the part one of a series that we're starting on electrification. So what we want to talk about with this series is really how to electrify, in many cases, your, your own homes, um, or if you are, you know, within the industry as builder or designer, how to, how to work on all electric projects, um, or how to talk to your clients about maybe having an all electric electric home. Um, so you can see the sessions on the screen, um, along with the dates. All these are up on the studio hpdc.org uh, website. So you can register for any of these that you want to attend. They're designed so that you don't have to attend, you know, all of them, you'll, you'll be able to kind of follow along if you just jump into a few. But if you do attend all of them, I think you'll get the overall kind of bigger picture as well. So it's up to you to attend what ones you can. Uh, today is we're going to, we're going to just do an introduction. Me and Kate are going to talk a little bit about different ways to, to look at energy use in your home, how to, how to calculate it. Um, and we're actually going to dive into two case studies. We're, we're actually each going to use our, our own homes where we've both been kind of working on incre incremental uh, home energy improvements. So we're going to kind of share some case studies of what, what we've done. Um, hopefully some experiences you guys can relate to. Um, on top of that, we want to make today a, a discussion. So feel free to, to really ask some questions and make some comments. Like I said, the chat room is, is perfect for that. As we go through the session, we'll actually, we can address some of the questions you guys put in the chat room. And then at the end, uh, we can open it up for questions completely. But please, you know, let us know what you're interested in. Let us know what questions you have. It'll help shape today's session. and It'll help shape future sessions as well. Um, so let's kind of dive into it. The, the first real you know, kind of thing that we were wondering is, you know, what is the goal for your home? When we talk about electrifying your house, I mean, that's a goal, turning it into an all electric house. But why are you guys here today? If anybody wants to share some stuff in the chat room, feel free. But these are some things that we came up with as sort of ideas for why you might be here, things you might be thinking about, you know, making your home net zero. I've certainly heard a lot of comments about folks who are interested in renewable energy and getting to a net zero home, getting off fossil fuels, of course. Um, one of the big, yeah, I think, motivators of going all electric in homes is 
to get rid of, of the use of fossil fuels uh, in the house, you know, specifically natural gas or oil um, or other forms of, of fossil fuels we use, kind of switching away from that due to the you know, carbon emissions associated with it. Um, just simply reducing your overall energy consumption. A lot of cases, a, a lot of the you know, electric uh, appliances we'll be talking about are more efficient than you know, their gas alternative. So simply switching to electric can reduce your overall consumption. So certainly that's a reason to do it reducing the cost of energy. Uh, these are all kinds of reasons there. So if you guys have your own reasons, feel free to jump in. I'm not seeing a whole lot jump in, so I'm going to keep going. But when we talk about kind of electrification, keep in mind that we're kind of talking about all these different goals and why we're doing this. Um, but here's some stuff, you know, kind of about the need to do it. Um, I think if you guys are here today, you, you may be motivated by this and very, you know, you may already have your reasons for being here. Um, but the reality is a, a huge portion of the carbon emissions from, from the building sector is coming directly from, you know, these energy related, you know, emissions from, from the fossil fuels we use from our heating and cooling of our homes, washing our clothes, cooking our food. Um, this is causing a, a lot of problems. When we talk about reducing carbon emissions in buildings, these are some of the, the things that we, some of the actual end uses we're trying to address. And electrification helps to address that. Obviously, the grid itself is not completely clean. We all know that. Um, it's moving in that direction to you know, rely a little bit more on renewable energy and rely on cleaner or less dirty fuels than it used to. Um, but one of the main principles is simply that all, all electric home, even if that you know, power plant is running on natural gas or, or petroleum and, or a combination thereof, it's a little bit more efficient than the one sitting in your basement. So by going all electric, by relying on the grid, we're helping to reduce some of those emissions that's coming from these various uses that we have just from living in our buildings. So looking at Massachusetts, where I imagine most of you guys are from, with uh, the studio uh, for Open Homes Design and Construction kind of focused on the Massachusetts area, but we, we get a lot of folks from all over. So we may have some folks today. Obviously, Kate's up in Vermont right now herself, so she can talk a lot about some of that northern New England stuff that's going on up there. I'm right in Boston, um, and the example of the home I'll be showing you is in Dorchester, where I live. Uh, but in Massachusetts itself, um, this is a study from uh, Rewiring America that showed that 93% of households in the state could save um, almost $900 million a year on energy bills. I'm, I'm pausing for a moment because I just want that, you know, to sink in a little bit. What, what we're really saying is by going all electric, you, the homeowner, can save money. And collectively, 93% of households can save money by going all electric. So when we think about some of the, you know, conversation around electrifying buildings, a lot of it is that about costs. People are worried that it's going to cost them more, that electricity, you know, costs more than gas, for example, or costs. But the reality is when you actually look at the, the study has been done about this, it, it, it has the opposite effect. It will save us money. Uh, we'll look a little bit on how that works here today. We're not going to get too much in the nuts and bolts of the numbers, but that's kind of one thing to wrap your head around here. This is not meant to cost you extra money. It's meant to, at the same time as shifting you off fossil fuels to reduce your energy expenditures. So where do the savings come from? Uh, so around 1.6 million households in, in Massachusetts alone um, are using very inefficient methods of heating and cooling, specifically electric resistance, uh, fuel oil, and propane. Uh, these are, are incredibly common in the state, far more common than they should be, and far more common than they are um, in other places in the country, specifically fuel oil, um, I should say, is much more common here than it is in other places in the country. And what this means is, well, a lot of us are using very dirty fuels to heat our cruel homes and very inefficient um, methods, very inefficient, uh, you know, uh, furnaces and boilers and things that are there. Um, so by going all electric, we all save. Simple as that. This is just showing you how it's kind of, you know, breaks down and everyone benefits, including low and moderate income people. Um, I'm going to skip past some of this because it's kind of just saying that this is a method of saving money in addition to reducing energy use and reducing carbon emissions. Uh, this gets a little bit at the reducing emissions part of it. Um, the key there is kind of the highlighted thing. 95% of residential building emissions um, are coming from your furnaces, your water heaters, dryers, and stoves. So when you think of, say, reducing energy use in your home, um, I know I've, I've had an energy audit, and if, I, I'll talk a little bit about an example, but I've had folks, you know, from Mass Save, they, they sponsor energy audits, and somebody came out to my house, and one of the first things they did is, you know, go around and make sure all my lights are LED lights. 
um, which is great. They give them out for free. It's fantastic. Um, but that's not having a large impact on reducing our carbon emissions in our home. Putting in uh, power strips that you know uh, help reduce the phantom phantom energy loads from our appliances has an impact, but it's not the largest driver. Really, the, these things are good. We shouldn't use LED light bulbs, but really the focus is on these other things, furnaces, water heaters, dryer stoves, the things that are actually most likely to right now be running on natural gas, propane, fuel oil. These are the sources of our largest, the largest sources of emissions in our homes. So by actually going ahead and switching, well, we're, we're addressing the, the, big, the big guns, as, so to speak, and we're creating jobs doing this. Um, over 5,000 installation jobs uh, alone from electrification just in the state. Um, so all sorts of benefits to, to individuals and all sorts of benefits to sort of greater, you know, greater society as well. Um, the last one here, and we'll talk, I'm actually going to show an example of this at the end of, of, my, of my kind of case study, but this can also improve health. All these sort of fossil fuels that we're burning. I mean, think about it. You have a furnace, probably, you know, if you're, you're in this session, you, and if you're like me, you still have a furnace in your basement. Uh, that's burning natural gas. That's polluting your home. You have a stove that is burning natural gas. That's polluting your home. These are things that we're doing right, then, right where we live, right where we sleep. Um, and it's having huge implications on indoor health. And everything from cognitive function in terms of how you know we think throughout the day, in terms of how much sleep we get, how good our sleep is, and our actual health. Um, so we're, we'll talk a little bit about this, and hopefully other sessions will kind of get into this as well as we start talking about uh, specific things. Um, so as before we kind of jump into the case studies we'll be talking about today, I want to just show these two graphs. So how homes use energy now. So this is from the EIA's residential energy use surveys, their, their latest one. And this is uh, Northeast. So this is everything basically uh, from New York uh, through, through New England. Um, you can kind of see how it breaks down. The vast majority of energy use in single family homes is space heating, uh, well over 50%. It's simply how we heat our homes. And then you have air conditioning, which is actually a small sliver. So for the most part, air conditioning is not a huge driver of energy use, but heating is. Um, you then have water heating after that, which is actually a pretty big, big chunk there, about 20% uh, is, is heating water. And then you have a few other things. So you have lighting, which is also a small sliver there. You have your refrigerators, and then you have other. So this, uh, this particular thing from the EIA doesn't uh, break down a lot of other things into specific categories. They just lump them together into other. So all your plug loads, your appliances, um, well, your non-refrigerator appliances, those are all kind of counted there in, in other. Uh, but as you can tell, the biggest, the biggest driver is that space conditioning, space heating, um, and a little bit of air conditioning, and then water heating. So we're going to you, you kind of see this a little bit in our examples, both me and Kate. Maybe we didn't necessarily go because of this, but the way we sort of addressed improving the home energy use is addressing those big drivers first, you know, focusing on space heating first, looking at insulation improvements and heating system improvements, and then moving on, say, to water heating, and then kind of going from there. Uh, the one on the right is just showing you how we compare to other regions in the state. Uh, that one there is just to show you, again, uh, New England overall, uh, uses a lot more energy in their homes. We, we simply use more energy than a lot of other places in the country, and most of that is because of space heating. Um, and it is cold here. That's one reason. But the Midwest, especially the upper Midwest, is, a, is colder than it is here. Um, and on average, they're using less, less energy to space heat. So where does that come from? What's the reason for that? Well, a lot of it has to do with that the stuff we were talking about earlier. We have old, inefficient homes that use old, inefficient equipment and old, inefficient fossil fuel-based equipment. So let's move into actually how we address energy use in our homes. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. Um, I'll come back here a little later, but for now, Kate, take it away. Great, thanks, Aaron. Um, so, you know, the title of this session was something around uh, how to, um, calculate your home's energy use. And so we wanted to give you a few tools that are out there and things to think about um, when you are considering, um, you know, how to tackle electrification. It really, like Aaron said, you really wanna go after some of the, the biggest nuts first. Um, so, you know, first basic step is just to, to start to do an inventory. 
um, gather your energy bills, whether that's, you know, the, your electric statements that come in the mail, um, you know, flips from natural gas, your heating oil supplier, propane supplier. Um, if you're like, I oh, got, I don't even have all these things. And so somewhere around here, it's in a box somewhere, you know, um, you can often call your fuel supplier and ask them to send you a summary statement for the year. And that will just give you the total, you know, total gallons delivered to your home in that time period or terms of gas. Um, so, you know, if you, if you don't have that information at your fingertips, there are ways to, to try and, and grab that. And then you also, if you are, um, if you have solar or any other form of renewable energy, you'll often also be able to track that off of your energy bill if you're net metered um, on the electric bill. Um, and I also, you know, we're, we're specifically talking about home energy use really focused here, but I wanted to, to throw in that if you're also interested in tracking like your vehicle energy use, there's some great apps that you can put on your phone, like Fuely is the one that I use, that every time you fill up, you know, you put in how many gallons and then over time you can be tracking your, your miles per gallon and how much, um, how many dollars and, and how many gallons of gasoline or diesel you're putting into your vehicle in a year. And that's also kind of an interesting thing to nerd out on if you're one of us, one of our us energy nerds. Erin, um, can you go to the next slide? So the other thing that you're gonna need to know to use one of these tools for calculating your home's energy use is you need to know your square footage. Um, they're pretty much all the calculators are gonna ask you for that. And typically it's, um, you know, the usable area. So you're not including attics or basements that are unconditioned. Um, and if you're not really sure what your home's energy use are, some of the places you could look to find it are, you know, a lister card with your with town or the city um, that they use for tax assessment purposes. That's usually public information that you can look up online. Um, if you've done an energy audit, um, it will say usually right at the top, you know, what their calculated square footage was. If you recently bought your home, maybe it's in a real estate listing, um, or you know, if you really <laughs> um, want to just get down and dirty, like get out the tape measure and measure it yourself. Um, and again, it, you don't have to be super exact, but it is useful, um, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, that you'll you need to know your your square footage. So one of the tools that's out there um, that we've been using a little bit is called the Zero Tool. Uh, it was put together by folks at the Architecture 2030 project. And it's basically, you know, it's a, it's a, this link, zerotool.org. You can go on and uh, play around with it a little bit and plug in information on your, your house to get basically what we're, what we're trying to get is what, what they call an EUI. And it, that stands for energy use intensity. And it's basically like a way for us to compare apples to apples when we're looking at buildings. So, you know, my building uses fuel oil, Aaron's uses natural gas, you know, they're in different units. So this is kind of like a way to create a, you know, a standard way of looking at all the buildings and, and compare energy use per square foot. Um, so let's just walk through, I, I, I went through this the other day and I grabbed some screenshots and so you can kind of just see real quick what the zero tool looks like. So I plug in my address here in Montpelier, Vermont. It auto automatically can tell from my zip code, what my degree days are. And so that's heating degree days and cooling degree days. Those will populate automatically. So you don't have to worry about trying to calculate that. And then I pick new construction or I picked existing building um, and go to the next one. And it wants to know, you know, is it residential, commercial, in this case, single family detached, but there are other options for condominium or apartment building, things like that. Next. Um, and then this is where I needed to plug in the square footage. So I've got 1500 square feet. Um, and then it's asking you, you know, what your energy reduction target is. This, you know, if sometimes, you know, this was designed for architects and people who are, who are working on projects where they have to hit a particular goal. Um, in my case, I just kind of picked a random, I said like, okay, well, what would it take to get the 50% energy reduction? So that's what I threw in there for this example. And then it's going to ask you about what kinds of energy have you purchased. And so this is where you really got to get the bills out. And um, but what I really like about this is you, you know, they have these drop down menus. You can select the type. And so I put in, you know, electricity from the grid. 
I have my I have a little spreadsheet that I made out of all my bills that I've been calculating. You'll see when we get into some of the case studies, I've got about 14 years of data on my house at this point, um, but I'm plugging in kilowatt hours for the electricity. Um, and then I primarily heat my house with wood. And so, um, you know, maybe not as common for those of you in Massachusetts, but um, throws in a whole wrinkle in a lot of these energy calculators. But I found um, a calculator and you can Google online and find a few different options, but basically helps you calculate the um, BTUs per cord of wood. Um, and in my case, you know, I kind of took the average of a few different, you know, it's, it's by, uh, is it maple or ash or birch, you know, you can, <laughs> um, I took kind of the average of some hardwood and put in 22 MBTUs per cord. Um, and I average about three cords a year. So that's where you get the 66 MBTUs. Um, but if you had other types of energy, you know, you might have a propane stove and um, fuel oil and wood and electricity. I mean, a lot of people have multiple sources of uh, energy and this allows you to fill in as many as you need to. So you can go to the next one, Aaron. Um, and then if you have any kind of renew any solar, you can plug that in as well. So I put it, I selected on-site solar and put in the kilowatt hours for that. Next. And so what this all pulls together is a calculation of your total EUI, again, the energy use intensity. Um, and this is kind of just showing like on a spectrum where my building is compared to a totally net zero building, which is zero, right? Um, and what this is saying is like the baseline of 36 EUI, that they call the baseline is basically like, if you built a brand new house today to efficient mod, you know, modern building code and energy code, it would be probably around 36 EUI. Um, so, you know, my building was built, my house was built in 1876. It's an old leaky, Cape farmhouse, you know? Um, so my energy use is, is clearly higher than um, a new house built today. Um, and then you kind of see the target. The target was like, if I want to get to 50% reduction, I'm trying to get, you know, into the 20s of the EUI. Um, and typically you have to be in the, in the 20s or the teens to be able to be truly net zero. So that's kind of one target to shoot for. Um, Aaron, you want to go next to the next one? And this just kind of breaks down. So once you've plugged in all your information, it, it, it again, there's a lot of numbers on here, but um, click to the next and it'll just kind of highlight the um, zero score. So like I said, the baseline zero score is based on a modern building. And then the next one um, just shows my EUI. If you click again. Yeah, then it'll show that's my net EUI after uh, accounting for the solar energy. So I was actually really surprised and thrilled that um, I've been tracking this in my own spreadsheet for many years. And when I plugged everything into the calculator, it came out exactly the same. So I must be doing the math right. Um, so that's basically one tool um, that you can use just if you want to get a handle on where your building is right now and where does it compare kind of on a spectrum of modern and net zero buildings. A lot of our old houses that we live in, you know, might have an EUI of 80 or 100 KBTUs per square foot per year. Like some of them are really leaky and, and have a really high EUI. So, I mean, it just, it just goes to show, um, like Aaron said, here in New England, we have old building stock um, and, often, you know, high energy use. And so don't be shocked if you run the calculator and, and end up in, in kind of that range. All right, Aaron, I'm gonna pass it back. Oh no, we're gonna go to the case studies. So this is just to tell you like a little bit about um, my house here in Montpelier and a little bit about the story. As we said, you know, part of the goal here is to just talk about like, what are the little, what are the different things you can do? What do you bite off? We, most of us can't go 100% electric all at the same time. So it's an incremental process. 
Um, but I'll show you a little bit about what I've been working on um, here, and then we'll, we'll go to Aaron's case study too. So, like I said, this is a cape um, built in 1876. It's for classic cape, uh, four bedrooms and one bath, and it has a forced hot air oil furnace and a wood stove. Um, we've got a 40 gallon uh, super insulated electric hot water heater, got an electric stove with a hood. Um, and for ventilation, we have a bath fan and the range hood. And uh, this winter, we're hopefully going to be installing an ERV, which is a heat recovery or energy recovery ventilator um, to bring in fresh air. And then we also will show you the, the EV charger. I'm driving a plug-in hybrid. Um, so that has affected our home energy use as well. Can we go to the next one. So this is, I'm not gonna go through all these details, but this timeline, since I bought my house in 2007, really the idea is um, we just are kind of like trying to show there's like every year or two, a little thing here or there, you know, trying to just chip away at this list. So, you know, our, you'll see when I, I show you the graph, like first year energy use was really high. We spent, we burned over 600 gallons of fuel oil. And then the next year we installed a wood stove. Um, then we replaced our hot water heater. We got an energy audit done. We did a bunch of regular, you know, basic weatherization. Um, there was no insulation in the walls at all. Uh, so we put in dense back cellulose in the walls and the attic. Um, then it was time to replace the furnace. And honestly, I couldn't find in, you know, back in 2011, a good option in terms of heat pumps were still relatively new to the market. And, you know, pellet, pellet furnaces are, are still actually fairly hard to find. So I, you know, between a rock and a hard place and I put in a new, more efficient hot air oil furnace, which, you know, I'm still kicking myself about. Um, but that's the way it is. We just try to use it as little as possible. Um, and, you know, we've been going through replacing a few windows here and there, a few doors with um, insulated doors. I bought into a community solar project. Um, we put in the EV charger, did a bunch of air sealing in the basement, replaced some appliances in this past year, um, and then I'll show you some of what's going on uh, as we speak right now in the uh, retrofit of our roof. So one of the things that you can do to be, you know, we'll talk about this more in the next session when we get into air sealing and insulation, but um, a blower door test is a way that you can find out how leaky your house is. Basically, they uh, depressurize the house and figure out how many um, cubic feet per minute are, you know, coming in through all the cracks in your house. Um, and so we did a when we did our first energy audit, we did a blower door test, came at 3,500 CFM 50. Um, we did our first round of weatherization and we're able to reduce that by about 30 percent. Um, then I just this year did another blower test before we started our second weatherization round. Um, and it, we had like brought it down another 600 CFM. Um, and that, I think that was a lot to do with some of the window and door replacements that we did um, and the basement air sealing. And so since, uh, since I bought the house, we've been able to reduce air leakage by 42%, which is pretty impressive, um, I think. And uh, we're gonna do another test when we finish the roof. And it would be really interesting to see uh, how much of a difference that la latest um, phase, you know, will impact things. Um, so stay, stay tuned for that. So as I mentioned, we primarily heat with wood. Uh, we, because of that, we only use about 100 gallons of oil a year. Um, and we burn about three cords of wood that is all locally harvested. Um, next. This is also just an example. We replaced a 1983 hot water heater with a super insulated electric hot water heater. Um, we'll talk more. We have a session on water heating specifically. Um, I chose not to put in a heat pump hot water heater because it is an uninsulated basement. Um, there, you know, the temperature stays in the 40s in the basement in the winter. And so we didn't want to risk freezing pipes um, by sucking any more heat out of the basement air. Um, but instead we just went for a, a super insulated hot water tank. Next. 
and this is just shows the the charge point car charger. Um, we had to put in a 220 uh, outlet to be able to plug that in. But um, here in Vermont, our electric utility, Green Mountain Power, they will actually provide these chargers for free uh, to anyone who has an EV. So that was pretty cool. I just had to pay for the, the electrician to install the outlet on the outside of the house. Next. And this just shows our uh, community solar array. So I was part of a group of about 20 people who helped um, do kind of a grassroots effort to, to build a 150 kW solar array. Um, and I own six kilowatts out of the 150. <laughs> um, and so that offsets about 75 to 85% of our annual electric use. And you'll see that on some of the next slides. And this just kind of shows, excuse me, some examples of the back of the house. Even after in, uh, we did our weatherization, um, we had icicles. You can see like the melting. So clearly there's air leakage in the roof. Um, and so next slide is what's happening right now on my roof. Um, I'm gonna go to the next one. So this was taken a couple weeks ago. We're adding five inches of exterior insulation and doing an extensive air ceiling um, in the, at the roof plane. Um, so this is a wood fiberboard insulation called Psycho uh, from Germany. Uh, so it's a carbon sequestering insulation material. And uh, we're getting ready to put some standing seam metal roofing on top of that. So I think, Erin, that is it for, oh yeah, a couple couple more graphs. So this just shows, like, as I mentioned, since I bought this house, because I'm an energy nerd, I've been tracking my electricity use. <laughs> and you can see how it's changed over the years. Um, you know, honestly, the electricity use uh, is not going down. <laughs> you can see um, part of that is I went from um, commuting to working at home. So the last six years, that's working from home um, and having a, an EV charger. Um, and so, you know, I think that that little bit of additional energy use has been primarily from those two things, but um, honestly, I don't exactly know. And it'll be interesting to see 2021 as well. Um, I've been doing a lot of analysis on um, public buildings and how their energy electricity use has dropped so much during the pandemic because a lot of those buildings were closed for the, a lot of the last 18 months but home energy use has in general increased. So 2021 and 2020, 2020 are both um, in some cases kind of outliers <laughs> um, when you look at trends over time. And then one more graph for you. Oh, sorry, on this one too, the orange is just the solar. So you, you see the um, portion that's provided by solar. Go back, go back. Yeah. <laughs> so it you know, varies from year to year. Some years we're like covering almost 90% of our usage. This year it was more like 75%. Depends on how much we're using and how sunny it is, basically, <laughs> the two factors there. Um, okay. And then the last one, Aaron, is this is tracking our total BTUs per year. So you see, Aaron showed us that pie graph that showed kind of where does our energy use come from. This tracks pretty well with it. The green is our wood. So the, the heating being usually two thirds to three quarters of our energy use. Um, the electric is the red. It's been pretty consistent as you saw in the previous graph from previous years. Um, and then the oil is the blue. Started off really high when we first bought the house and we were just on oil. And then it has um, you know, decreased. Some years we don't buy any oil because we don't have to, we only fill up like every other year. Uh, so there's some years where it's down at zero. Um, and Brian asked the question, how am I tracking this energy? It's like, I have an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> so no fancy software, but usually like once a year, I just like get out that stack of electricity bills and I like plug the numbers into the spreadsheet and I put in the total consumption and then the solar fact, the amount of kilowatts that came from solar. Um, and then I, you know, get my one oil bill and then I, estimate the wood. The wood is the hardest part because we're just getting wood from a variety of sources. We never like totally use it all. So 
that's more of an estimate, but this kind of just shows I've been estimating approximately three chords <laughs> for, for the last seven or eight years. Um, okay, I'm going to hand it back over to Aaron for the second case study. All right, great. Thank you, Kate. Um, definitely keep the discussion going in the chat room. I see a lot of stuff in there. Some of this stuff I'm actually going to address uh, as I go through this. I've had some ventilation issues in my own home and some uh, air air pollution issues uh, from, from, say, the gas stove and stuff. So I'm going to get to some of that throughout this um, and see if I can address some of these questions as I, I go through it, as well as some of there's been some questions about the cost of, say, uh, switching from gas to electric uh, with some of the, say, the infrastructure in your home, like having to upgrade your electrical box. Uh, those are some stuff I dealt with as well. So I'm going to address some of that as I go through this, but keep asking questions if I don't address exactly what you want to know. Uh, but anyway, this is my home. This is in, in Dorchester, which is, uh, for those outside of the area, it's a neighborhood of, of Boston. Um, it's an old home here. I got I moved in there in, in 2018. Um, so, but the home itself was built way back in 1896, actually by a shipbuilder from Nova Scotia. Um, it's amazing what you can find out uh, from assessor's data and Googling. Um, the size of the building, 2008 square feet, um, four bedrooms, uh, one bath. Uh, so outside of energy improvements, uh, my focus is getting a second bath in here, uh, but focusing on energy problems, let's look at what we got. So heating, uh, this use is forced hot air, natural gas furnace um in in my basement um with with ducts the ducts so pretty much every room has uh has an air duct coming into it however there's only one cold air return duct on the main floor of the house it's kind of a big one in in the floor of basically the the dining room family room sort of area um so that's sort of an interesting way that this is set up and i think i've seen that in a lot of old homes in in the area in massachusetts where they you know originally they didn't have that ducted hot air system but at some point the house had that installed uh, maybe a while ago compared to compared to us now uh, but the ducts sort of were set up in weird ways not always balanced properly um, ideally you'd want a cold air return in every single home or sorry in every single room that you have a, have a um, the entrance in but i don't have that so cooling is done just through window AC units. So I don't have any dedicated cooling system right now. Uh, most summers we use we use three um, units in different parts of the house. Um, they, they're various sizes. Two of them are are newer um, LG units that are are more efficient and also use. Um, the new uh, the newer type of coolant that's slightly better uh, than the older coolant in terms of uh, global warming potential. So that's sort of a, a good advantage there. But at the end of the day, I'm still using window AC units. Hot water is currently uh, provided by a tankless gas heater system. So this I'll talk about in a bit, but that's actually something I put in after I moved in here. I replaced a very, very old um, and somewhat leaky uh, tanked heater, a uh, gas heater with a tankless gas heater. Um, but some of the decision processes I went through to do that instead of an electric one are, are some interesting stuff that I'll share with you. Um, for cooking, just a gas stove, gas top range, a ventilation, which I definitely want to talk about and some questions about. Um, for me, it's done through done through fans, window fans and bathroom exhaust fan. I actually currently don't even have a kitchen hood. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the complications with that. Uh, but some window fans are actually used in the kitchen currently. And rather than blowing air out, or sorry, rather than blowing air in, I'm blowing air out. Uh, the basement, uh, just for reference, is an unfinished uh, cement floor, stone foundation basement, uh, certainly leaky, um, and definitely one of the areas to address with insulation and air sealing. So I'll get to that as well. So some of the things that I've already done. Uh, so insulation, number one, uh, is added uh, insulation in. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But what I went through is uh, here in Massachusetts, we have the Mass Save program. If you guys have not had a massive energy audit, I recommend you do it. It is no cost. And one of the benefits is you can get insulation. So basically through, through the audit, they'll recommend different insulation improvements. I talked to them as well because I kind of knew going in what insulation I wanted. I, I knew I wanted in the walls. I knew I wanted in the attic. In this house, when I moved in, the walls had no insulation in, in most of the walls and the attic had no insulation whatsoever. So Mass A program put that in. Um, and 75%, I should mention, of the insulation cost was covered by the Mass A program. So very, very um, cost-friendly improvements to the home. Air sealing, did some spray foam in the attic uh, before the insulation was put in. And then uh, in the basement, spray foam was added sort of, you know, around the sill plate and foundation connections. Uh, there's also old casement windows in there that are kind of leaky and uh, not a lot of them are even opening anymore, but I kind of did some air sealing around those edges as well. 
Um, and then air sealing around in different openings, so the windows and doors. So for this, um, used a lot of weather stripping. So you just went in and made sure every door, every window had weather stripping so that you had a really tight seal when it was closed. And then sort of other improvements that I put in. Uh, so insulation around hot water pipes um, and insulating tape put on heating ducts. So insulating tape, I mean, sort of, you know, where, where the ducts, where the joints and the ducts are. Um, I put tape around there. Um, in a lot of cases, I mean, if you're going to, you know, fully weatherize your home, you'll put some actual insulation around some of your, your ducts, but uh, all I've done so far is, is do the tape. And then, as I mentioned, upgraded the, the hot water heater. So let's look a little bit at some data. I have various charts here, with a lot of stuff. I'm going to do my best to kind of walk through what these mean. Uh, but basically, I'm just trying to tell a story of how, you know, how my gas uses, electricity uses have changed throughout these last couple of years, and what, what are some things we can maybe take away from that. Um, and, and, but really, I want to give you guys an idea of how to look at your own energy uses and how to think about it. Uh, so in terms of the data here, where does this come from? So for me, um, here in Boston, I have a, a national grid for my gas, and I have Eversource for my electric. Uh, in both cases, I can log on to their, to their, to their website, to, their, to my online account with them. And in both cases, they will show me a history of my energy use that I can export to an Excel file. So if you you know, you can go through your bills and, and look at them individually if that's something you do. Um, or you can just, you know, go on to the, the online account and you can get a spreadsheet showing you your month by month usage. Um, in some cases, I think uh, for a more recent time period, you might even get day by day usage. But if you want to go back, you know, several years, I think the, the most you can narrow it down to is month monthly usage, but it gives you a good idea and a good way to track your energy uses. So that's what I did for my gas usage. This came from my national grid account and I downloaded it there and put it into an Excel sheet. So this is showing you every month um, since around the end of 2018. Um, so if you're looking at this data, you're going to run into the same, same, same things I did, which is number one, the data isn't exactly monthly. So you see the first thing is December 10th, 2018. That's the first date. That is the date the meter was read. So that's not telling you that's the energy usage for the month of December. That's telling you the energy usage from the last time it was read up until that date. So the next month would be basically be between December 10th and January 10th. And that's that date. So when you kind of compare this, you kind of have to take that into account. These are one of the tricky things that you have to look into when you look at your energy usage. But it's something to pay attention to. Um, the green graph here, sorry, sorry, the green line is just showing you the trend line. So what you can see is over time, the gas usage has gone down. Obviously, it's highest in winter months because I use gas for heating. I also use it for cooking. So as I mentioned, the cooking is gas. And I have a gas dryer as well. So all, those are the main sources of gas. Oh, and the gas water heater, I apologize. So four main uses of gas. But as you can see, the winter months are the biggest. Um, and that would really be driven by heating um, and probably a little bit more energy use for water heating. Um, so I'm gonna go here, let's see if I can click. Yep, so you can see right about there is when I added insulation. So that's when I had the weatherization team come in with the 75% of it being covered by mass save and added insulation in the attic and the walls. And that's also the time when I did all that air sealing I was talking about. So the air sealing in the attic and the air sealing in the basement. Um, some of the weather stripping was done around that same time. Um, generally, in the, I guess that same time frame, the, the weather stripping was done as well. Um, so notice a little drop there, right? Well, is that because of the improvements I made? Or is it because of other reasons? That's a good question. And it's one that I've been trying to figure out. So if you kind of look at the other big jumps, that are, are the last two winners. Uh, definitely the peaks are lower than they were in that 2019 winter. So that's an improvement. That's great. Um, but how can you kind of determine, is this because of the insulation? Is it because of other things? Obviously, the question you might ask is, well, were those just warmer winters? Did you not you need to heat as much? So if that's a question you're trying to figure out, there's ways to go about figuring that out. So for me, uh, this is, sorry for the different format here, but I had to pull some different data. So I, I use a website called degreedays.net. There's, there's other ones out there, but I recommend this one. It's free and it's easy to use. But what you can pull is information on something called heating degree days. Um, there's also something called cooling degree days, which I'll show in a moment on another slide. But this is a way of basically summarizing how, how much heat do you need to provide? You know, basically taking the, the temperature data, uh, and figuring out, you know, how much how much heating is, is needed. Um, 
So the orange line is tracking you, tracking the heating degree days for each of those months. Uh, the blue bars are, are that same information we saw on the other slide, just in a different format. It's, it's my therms, my, my gas usage. So what you can see is that the heating degree, degree days are actually lower in, in this, these last two winters. The, or sorry, the, the heating degree days are are, are higher than my energy usage. You can see the gap on the chart. So basically that first winter, that 2019 winter, my energy usage pretty much mirrors that the third, or sorry, the heating degree days. When you get into 2020 and 2021, my energy usage is a bit lower than what the heating degree days would predict it would be. So that tells you that perhaps my improvements, say the insulation and the air ceiling improvements did make a difference. Now it's not conclusive, but you know it's 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 worth further exploration. But that, that's a good sign, and that's something I was happy to see, and that's something to let me know that maybe this stuff is making an impact. And that's one way that you can figure out in your own home is this is this impacting things. So this is electricity now. So electricity for me is everything else. Um, obviously, I I mentioned the window AC unit. So cooling is electric, and then all the other appliances and whatnot. So uh, the dotted line is again the trend line, and everything else is just the month by month thing. So my trend line is going slightly up. So I've been using a little bit more electricity as the years have gone by. Um, but this is what it looks like. So one of the things that may jump out to you, I don't know if this will, but if you're looking at this graph. That the last, what is it, three months ago, where it says August 12th, look at that drop. Um, this is just kind of, this is just a fun exercise, I think, just to kind of get your caps on and think about, you know, how do you analyze energy use? Is there any guesses for, for why that's so low? Why would that be so low that month? And I promise you, the answer is actually very simple um, once you know it. Oh, wow, yes. Way to go, guys. Um, so many of you with the answer. Yeah, it's vacation. That's exactly it. I actually went um, and visited. I drove out to the Midwest, where I'm originally from, um, out in out of Minnesota, uh, where it gets really cold, um, and uh, visited some family. And look at that energy use just dropped dramatically. So, take those things into account when you look at this. Taking your own behavior. Were you in the house more often than you were? Did you have guests staying with you that may have used, you know, maybe you took more showers because people were around? Who knows? Um, but think about those things when you look at this. Um, you're the one who knows this stuff. When you came home and did lots of laundry. Yeah, that's the spike. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great questions about September. So let's talk a little bit about that. So here's this graph again, like we saw last time. Sorry for the change in format, but just so I could get all the data here. This is now showing you cooling degree days, just the inverse. So this comes from the same website. You can pull cooling degree days, just like you can pull heating degree days. So the, the orange line is showing you cooling degree days. So if we look there, you can see that month where, of course, I didn't do anything. But then that big spike in September, that also is the, was the highest need for cooling of the whole year. So... Again, that doesn't tell us definitely that the reason that my energy uses was so, my electricity uses was so high in September was because of cooling, but it gives you kind of a clue to think that might be one of the reasons. So what does this all mean? So I'm going to bring up the chat room just in case folks have other ideas. If folks do have other ideas, please let me know too, because I haven't solved this, this problem either. Um, but let's see. So what does this all mean? Oh, I love this charging up the EV uh, one. Thank you, Mike. I unfortunately, I just I have a hybrid. I can't plug it in quite yet. Um, part of that reason is so this is kind of when you get into decision makings. But I I don't have a driveway. I just have on street parking. So I was thinking through how do I get a charger in my house. Um, I went with an EV or sorry with a hybrid. Um, what does this all mean? So heating is still one of the biggest drivers of energy use for me. Um, though the insulation and air sealing certainly had an impact, at least it does, you know, when I look at the, the graphs, I think that shows that my insulation and air sealing had an impact. So what can I do about that? Well, I can put in more insulation and more air sealing. I know places where we weren't able to get, there's one part of the attic that we weren't quite able to get into without kind of cutting through a wall and we didn't do that. So that's something that I could do. Uh, there's also a lot more air sealing opportunities in the basement, um, that, that I could get to that are just kind of harder to reach places. Uh, so there are some, some further um, insulation air that I could do. Also, electric heat pump. Got a question there, Mark, because I don't know when. 
that is probably on my list of, of say appliances to upgrade is definitely putting in a heat pump. Um, I'll walk through some of that decisions here in just a moment after I go through this though. So cooling, um, there's also that small uh, though noticeable impact. I think there was sort of uh, some, some spikes in the high cooling months um, in, for electricity. So what are things I can do about that? Well, I could replace that old inefficient window unit. I mentioned I have three, but but only two of them are newer, more efficient ones. So I could upgrade that one. Um, also electric heat pump. Uh, for those who are new to heat pumps, the name is a very, very big deceiver here because heat pumps provide cooling and heating at the same time. Well, sorry, not at the same time, they at different times, but they provide both of those services. So uh, that's something that I could do that would also help the cooling problem. Um, other possible energy use drivers. So dehumidifiers. I haven't really talked about that today. And in another session, we might get into that a little bit because I've noticed certainly this, this very, very humid summer that we've had, uh, that I've had a lot, that my dehumidifier has been running constantly in my basement. Um, so that, that could be one thing that's driving up energy use in the months as well. So when we looked at that uh, graph and you saw September went up, you guys had some good guesses about why that is. I mentioned maybe AC because September had a lot of, had surprisingly had some high cooling degree days. Well, when I came home from that road trip, I actually had a lot of moisture in my basement because my uh, dehumidifier was full. So I was running my dehumidifier on high for basically the entire month of September to dry it out. So that could also be something that drove up the energy costs. You'll kind of get, if you're getting the impression that a lot of this is guessing, you're right. It's basically making educated guesses on how we use our electricity, looking at the data that we can get and thinking through like, okay, what are things that I did those months? What are some correlations that I can draw from this? So cost. So insulation, as I mentioned, was covered 75% by mass save and the air ceiling was 100%. So this is something where it's just, you know, I don't think there's any question about that should be any hesitation. If you guys have any, you know, question, any concerns about the insulation in your homes or about the air ceiling, do this, definitely do it. Now, the water heater is something I want to mention because I did upgrade my water heater. And contrary to what we're talking about today, I did not go electric. I went gas. I did this uh, two years ago in 2019, um, a few months after, after I moved in. Um, actually, sorry, the end of 2018, a few months after I did this. So why did I go with gas? Well, at the time, it was a lot cheaper. And there were two reasons for that. One, the, the actual water heater itself, the gas model was, was slightly cheaper, but the bigger issue was actually something that somebody brought up in the chat room here today that they faced, which is that I needed to upgrade a lot of my uh, electric infrastructure in order to do, um, in order to have an electric water heater, which I did not need to do for a gas infrastructure. Gas. Also, the location in my basement where I was placing the gas water heater also was right next to the existing gas line. So there's very little um, new gas infrastructure that was needed. So those were a lot of the cost savings. Two years later, um, the system itself is working really well. Um, so that's a plus. However, looking at the numbers now, I would actually make a different decision. I would have gone, I would now, if I was making the decision today, I would go with an all electric water heater. I think part of that is the cost of, of them have dropped a little bit. So now it's no longer uh, quite the discrepancy between getting a gas one or getting an electric one. Um, and while the cost of upgrading my electro electrical system has not gone down, the fact that I wanna get a heat pump in the future means I'm probably gonna do that anyway. So, I would probably make the different decision today and get get a, a, an electric one. But the 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 one I got, it is a tankless on demand system, and I have noticed a considerable improvement in both the, my water usage and and the heating uh, needed for for the water. So it has been an improvement. So let's look at some of the questions because that's kind of the main stuff that I had here that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah. Hey, thank you. Yes, Candid. Life isn't perfect. I mean, that's what we're trying to get through in this in this session is really kind of walk through some of the decisions we made because, you know, I've, I've been a part of a lot of case studies. I presented on a lot of case studies where we show you guys the, the ideal example of, you know, high performance home or in a lot of my work of the passive house uh, that I would love to, you know, build someday for myself. But that's 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 in the future. Today, I live in an old home, which I'm sure a lot of you guys do. And we're wrestling with these decisions on you know, kind of on making incremental improvements. So let's look at some of the questions and talking about what's going on here. Um, ah, great point here that I'm just gonna go. Audrey says, if you went with a heat pump water heater, it would help with your moist basement. 
hundred percent correct. <laughs> and that yeah. is a really, really great point. I'm sorry, was somebody <laughs> talking there? That was me. Um, I was just going to jump in and say yes, there was a question earlier on about the um, community solar and and just to answer the question about my community solar project, you can get it. We did get federal tax credit um, because it is owned. Um, there are some community solar projects where it's actually kind of more of a leasing situation where you can't get the credit. Um, but in our case, you, we, we were able to. Um, and of course, the federal tax credits for solar have been changing, although word is that maybe this new reconciliation infrastructure package might renew some of the tax credits. But um, Aaron, do you know anything about tax credits for, or, or, or community solar projects in Massachusetts that, that might be available to folks? Yeah. Um, so I don't know 100% because as you, you said, Things have changed. Even in Massachusetts, things have been changing a little bit. If somebody knows in the chat room, please let me know. But um, for the most generally, no. Generally, the tax credits are are used sort of when you own solar. When you're using, say, a community solar project um, off site, you are probably not getting those credits. Mm -hmm. However, it is, there's different community solar pr uh, providers out there. So this, you know, I can't with a blanket yeah, I statement, I can't cover everybody. But in general, they should factor that into the price they're charging you for community solar, i.e. the fact that they receive right. tax credits should be factored into the price that you on. pay them. Yep. Yes. And so, Susan suggested that uh, Energy Sage website is a great resource to find out about community solar projects. So yes, that's definitely great one. One to, that's um, a good one to check out. Yeah, and something here uh, that I just saw, so somebody talked about mass save as part of the energy assessments and weatherization, will they do a blower door test? Uh, somebody else answered that some some of the companies do, some don't, that's true. So um, with mass save, so when you do a mass save assessment, generally it's not you know a mass save employee coming to your house, it's a home energy services provider who has a contract with mass save that's coming out to your home. Uh, so if you know you wanna, and they're gonna do things like they're gonna give you light bulbs, they're gonna do all the, you know, installation stuff, that's pretty standard. But if you know you want something specific, like you want a blower door test, make sure you ask that contractor you talk to if that's something they do. If it's not, find somebody who, who does do that, who says yes to that question, um, who is also, who also provides another the Mass Save program. Um, because some will. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, Kate, if you see other questions that we're missing, let me know. I'm kind of looking through here. A lot of good discussion, yeah, actually. A lot of good discussion. I mean, I think there was, there was a whole thread here about heat pump, hot water heaters, how they can reduce humidity in your basement. Um, you know, I talked a little bit in, in my example of why I didn't go with the heat pump, hot water heater. So we'll get into that in a lot more detail on the water heating session about sort of pros and cons, like when the good example of when a heat pump hot water heater makes sense. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think, let's see if there are any other comments here. Yeah, um, put some other questions if you have them. Um, but one of the takeaways that you guys might get from this um, is that a lot of what we talk about with electrification is incremental improvements. For most of us in existing old homes, we're not doing this at once. We're making decisions, you know, every now and then on, on projects that we have going, going on in our buildings, and we're, we're trying to make the, the right decision each time. Um, so hopefully uh, this session is giving you a little clearer idea on what the right decision might be for you and how you should go about thinking it. And through the rest of this series, uh, we're going to dive, oh, dive into things more specifically. Oh, folks, I forgot I just had one other slide that I'm going to go back to. Um, I know some of you guys are leaving here, but I, I do want to hit on this because this is about the health benefits. If you guys need to go, go. But for those of you who can stick around, just take a look at this graph. This is my house. This is for this is a uh, air quality monitor that I have placed on a second floor bedroom um, that's measuring air quality index. And this is just a, a, um, a snapshot of one day. And what you can see in that one day is there's a couple spikes in AQI. Oh, all right. Um, any guesses on what those spikes correspond to? Cooking, thank you, Brendan, for participating. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, cooking. Um, so I was cooking 
on the first floor, mind you, um, and on my second floor bedroom, those spikes during two different two hour periods um, went into the unhealthy levels. So something to think about that we'll address later in the topic when we talk about cooking stoves <laughs> on the benefit of that. Uh, the sensor, this is the IQ Air. Um, so there's lots of different ones out there. This is, this is one of the ones that I use. IQ Air, I recommend, is a pretty good one. But we'll talk about these at a later session. In spite of the vent. Um, so Janet, good question. So at this time, um, I didn't have a, a kitchen vent. What I had is a, a, a fan going out a window. So this is, you're absolutely right. This, that was running while this was going on. So lesson, fan is not enough. Get a really big exhaust hood. <laughs> um, it did drop, as you can see, after those, after it took, it, it looked, the air, bad air quality lingered for a couple hours upstairs, but then it dropped. Part of that, I think part of the reason it was able to drop was because um, it's, it was cold enough that it, my heating system was on. Um, and my heat in, within my sys, heating system, I have a MERV 12 filter. So I'm blowing really clean air into the rooms. So perhaps that was one reason that it was able to drop back to a normal level. And Tom, the answer is yes, without a doubt. <laughs> um, there has been, I mean, this is, for me, it's just a matter of, you know, when <laughs> I've had a, you know, been working with contractors on redoing redoing my kitchen and the the one the number one ask I make is I'm not you know I'm not in this for the uh, type of countertops I get but I'm in this for the electric stove that I'm going to get um, that is <laughs> that is my top of my list for the kitchen renovation. Great. Well, so, Karen, maybe you want to go to the last slide and we yep, can just talk about the the other sessions coming up. Yep. Um, so we did a good introduction today. These next ones will dive in more in depth on a lot of these topics. Mm -hmm. Kate, anything you want to end with? No, I mean, yeah, insulation air sealing is next up and we'll talk about sort of, yeah, weatherization in general, things to be looking for, because it's really about reducing your heating load. It's that, you know, you really got to make the reduction in your heating load before you go changing out the source of your heating so that it's sized properly. So, um, yeah, looking forward to the rest of the series and you can sign up at studiohpdc.org. All right. Thank you all for being here. Have a good night.